rice diversity and update on the gene bank. And with that, it's time for some questions and answers. So. Uh, speaking of the IP issues, uh, what's your take on uh, people looking into um, putting patents or IPs on genes? Yes, that's a difficult one. There is language in the SMTA about that. But the lawyers still disagree what it means. Uh, whatever it does mean is what we have to follow. Because we, we can't, we are considered biased and not competent in, in a legal sense to make decisions on those kind of things. What it says in the SMTA is that you're not allowed to protect anything about material received or its genetic components in the form receipt. So I can tell you my interpretation of that is that if you try to patent the gene itself, you haven't changed its form, you can't do that because you haven't, that goes against the SMT. But actually you don't ever do that. You put the gene together with a package of DNA surrounding it, some, some markers, a way of using it. And if you do that, you can patent your, your product that includes the gene. There was quite an interesting case recently when Thailand patented the aroma gene. That there was a lot of publicity in the Thai literature how wonderful it was that Thailand has protected this gene. And actually, when you looked at what they protected, they hadn't protected the gene. They protected the whole package of what made it useful, made their knowledge useful. And that's much more than just knowledge of the sequence. And that's okay. It, at least that's my interpretation. If you're, you can protect your own intellectual property, which is the package that you put together, but you can't protect someone else's property, which is the original sequence per se. Okay. Uh, very nice overview, but yes, and also you open something on the post CBD, and 60% of that material which you showed that it's not been utilized, and it's very obvious, you also know. We also know why we are not using that. Being the, the I think, uh, the wisest man in the germ plasm in the ERI, can you say that how we can go ahead with that? Probably because in the coming new IP structure, is coming in the PBGB, you also part of that, it's going to be more complicated. How we can open up that so that we can utilize more that type of germ plasm in our building stock without you the IP issues and other things? Actually, what I put up there was only the material that you can now freely use. It, it's under the treaty. And under the treaty, there are no more worries about using it. All, all that material is coming either from countries that are now members of the treaty, or even some from countries that are not members of the treaty, but gave us permission to put the material under the treaty. So we no longer have to worry about the that CBD is no longer relevant. The, the, the fact that so much of that has not yet been evaluated is it, just because of the worry of the hearing breeders at the time. But at that time, if you look at the, the rate of transfers from GMAC to PBGB back in the late 1990s, it went almost down to zero. Uh, and that, that was our, because of our concern about the, the possible influence of, our, of, of the CBD. But the treaties provide the solution. So if you want that material, there's nothing at all that's stopping you from uh, One final question, Elia. Is it too hard keeping all those accessions when only a very small part is being actively used? Is it worth it? Yes, the idea is it's worth it. Um, it. It kind of goes back to the, the theory that there's a famous evolutionary biologist called R.A. Fisher, 
who published what he called the fundamental theorem of natural selection, the rate at which you can respond to a new selection pressure is proportional to the genetic variance for fitness. And in, in an agricultural context, that means the more genetic variation we have, the more likely we are to be able to respond to, to any challenge. And the reason only 5% have made it through into crosses is just because the methods available to us to date have not been able to identify the, the particular genes of importance in most of those varieties. We, we just haven't had the technology, or, although they've screened the, the breeders have screened as, as, almost as much as they possibly can do. Just a phenotypic screening is not enough to, to identify what's right. So I, I don't see any problem with the fact that we have only got five percent into the in, into the breeding program so far through to crossing. I'd expect a with the new tech, technologies we can increase that a lot, and b we need to keep for for tomorrow. Tomorrow's challenge is even the material that is not appropriate for the day of the case. So with that, I would like just to add, add a comment. And one thing that would really help in deciding uh, in the decision-making process when requests come in for material that people want. Erie's invested a lot over the years, various groups screening material. But the information doesn't feed back to the gene bank. So if you would be willing to share your phenotyping results with us so that we could get it into the system, it would go a long way to increasing the value of the system, too. So on that note, uh, let us uh, thank Rory and, and give him the now uh, Routine uh, certificate of appreciation for the first uh, being part of the first.